song. Do you love to praise him? I love to praise him. I love to praise him. I love to. Come on, lend your voices. I love to praise Him. I love to praise. I love to praise His name. I love to praise Him. I love to. Come on, do you really love to praise him? He's my rock, my rock, and he's my will in the middle. I know he'll never, no, no, no. He's just the jewel. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love to. Come on, one more time. Holy name. He's my rock. My rock. And he's my will. In the middle. I know he'll never, no, 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 he's just a jewel, hey, hey, hey. oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love to in the morning, late in the evening. His Come on, do you love to praise him? Come on and give him some praise. Amen. Our scripture reading tonight would come from Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. And it reads, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Amen. That's the word of God for God's people. You may be seated in the presence of God. Would you bow your head just for a moment? Father, we thank you again for the privilege of prayer. And we thank you now that we can come and make our request known unto thee. And God, you told us that whatever we're going through, that we could cast our cares upon you, for you care for us. So God, is somebody here today, Master, that's going through we pray tonight that you would give them a word, that something be said that may help them along the way. Help us, Master, to continue to encourage each other, put our arms around each other, and let us each and every know that everything is going to be all right. And we thank you for this host church. We thank you for this pastor 
and we thank you for the members of Strangers Rest. And we pray, God, that it is with our presence that we could be a blessing unto them. We pray for the preacher that's going to come and stand behind this sacred desk. Speak to him and speak through him that we may leave this place better than we came. And would you please forgive us for our sins and our sinful nature. Wipe our slate clean that we can stand before your presence. And we will forever remember to give you the praise and the glory you so rightfully deserve. In the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. amen. Come on, let us say amen. Give God a hand clap of praise to, again to this, this pastor, Pastor Brown. Uh, we, we have a short program today. We thank you for your presence. Won't you give yourself a hand for being here tonight? We're glad to have you with us on tonight and thank you for having us pastor pastor brown uh, we're, we're going to move a little higher up in the program and uh, the program now calls for a fellowship encourager by pastor melvin petty pastor of the mount olive baptist church waco texas would you give him a big eight in as they come What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adores him. What a mighty God we serve. Give an honor to God and to the angel of this house, Pastor Brown, and to this wedding congregation. We are glad to be with you this evening. We are honored and humbled for this opportunity to be able to stand before you and speak at this time. I know we have a great preacher coming, uh, and so I'm going to say my little piece, and I'm going to move on. Amen. Amen. There is a word found in Mark chapter 9, uh, verse 5, and I just want to share just a few little scattered remarks with you, and I'll be, I'll be finished. Mark 9, chapter 5 says, and Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make these tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And that's it. Amen. Amen. It's good to be here. That's, that's what I want to talk about. It's, it's good to be here. Amen. It's, it's good to be here. Uh, uh, by way of introduction, let me, let me tell you a story. Uh, I, 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 I used to enjoy watching boxing. I'd watch boxing on television and uh, at one time there was a fella, they said he was the baddest man on the planet, Iron Mike Tyson. Iron Mike Tyson. And you know if you live by the sword, you'll eventually <laughs> die by the sword. And there was somebody that got him. Oh, Buster Douglas knocked him out over in Tokyo. Uh, but Mike got on the comeback trail. He wasn't going to just lay down and let anybody just take his title. He got on the comeback trail, and so on the comeback trail, he was fighting a fella by the name of Donovan Razor Ruddock. And Razor Ruddock had a tremendous left hook. He was known for his left hook. And, and during the fight, Iron Mike was carrying the fight. He was getting at him pretty good, but all of a sudden, Donovan Ruddock hit him with one of those left hooks. Mike Tyson's eyes rolled in the back of his head, and he wobbled a little bit. But the good news for Mike is that the bell rang. And when the bell rang, he got to go back to his corner. And you see, when he was headed back to his corner, he had a good corner to go to. Because they didn't wait for Mike to get to them. They went and met Mike. Helped him back to the corner. Sat him down on his stool. They poured water on him. They had a man massaging his arms and his neck, telling him, it's going to be all right. There was a man in his corner in his face telling him, you the champ, Mike. You can take him. You can take him. You the champ. But the thing is, he only got a minute in the corner. After one minute, he had to go back out and face R Donovan Runnick again. And so here, the bell rang, but he had a good minute in his good corner. And in the next round, yeah, Iron Mike took out old Donovan Ruddick. I, I said all that to say this. Everybody need a good corner to go to. Everybody needs a good corner to go and, and get some relief. Uh, and and the, the cold-blooded thing is that you can't stay in your corner. 
after you've gone in your corner for just a little while, you got to get back out and fight. In this text, we see uh, Jesus has taken three of his disciples. He didn't take everybody. He didn't take Bartholomew. He didn't take Andrew. He didn't take any of those other fellows, but he took Peter, James, and John. He called three out. He said, y'all come with me. And he took them up on a high mountain. And when they went up on the high mountain, God began to work up on that mountain. Jesus uh, transfigured himself. He, in other words, he revealed glory to them. Uh, they're on that mountain. And as they were there on that mountain, they, they saw Elijah. You know Elijah, don't you? Elijah was that, that prophet that, that walked with the Lord and did great miracles for the Lord. And he never tasted death. He just rolled away on a chariot. Swing down, sweet chariot. Let me ride. He, he rode away from here on a chariot. But, but then there was also Moses. You know Moses, don't you? Moses was the lawgiver. Moses was the liberator, the one that led the children of Israel out of bondage. Here there's a three-way conversation going on between Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. Can't you imagine how good that conversation was? And the conversation was so good, they were so amazed at the glory that the Lord was showing them up top of this mountain that Peter just couldn't help himself, and he cried out, it's good to be here. It's good to be here. And I came to tell someone, it's been good to be with y'all this day. Amen. It's, it's been good to be, it's good to be here with you right now in God's house. But the crazy thing is, just like I and Mike, we can't stay here. We, we can't stay here. We, we're just here for a little while. They, I'm glad they had a good time up on the mountain, but they had to get back down to the valley because the devil was creating havoc down in the valley. So I came by to tell somebody today, enjoy your mountaintop while you can because eventually you got to deal with the devil down in the valley. Here, Peter, he said a good thing when he said it was good to be here, but he ca carried it on just a little bit too far. When he said we need to build monuments, I know that we don't have time to build monuments because we got to fight devils. Devils in our school, devils in our home, devils trying to get into our churches. We got some devils we got to fight. My brothers and sisters, I came by to tell somebody iron does sharpen iron, and that's why we're here this week. We're here to sharpen one another. We're here to get sharp, but you know what? Iron can't sharpen iron if the utensils are separated. They have to come together, and they have to be brought together, just like Jesus brought Peter, James, and John together. He brought us together here to sharpen one another. I'm out of here when I tell you this. There's a story about an old man and a young man. The young man was a champion woodcutter. He, he was a champion woodcutter and he, he, he knew everybody knew he was a champion woodcutter. He was young, he was built up, he was strong and when he, when he spoke, people listened. But there was an old man that showed up on the scene. The old man said, you know what young fella, I think I can chop more wood than you. And the old man, he told him that and the young man said, yes, let's, let's see what you can do. So they set it up. They set up the contest to chop some wood. And here they go. They go to chopping wood. Axes are flying. Splinters are going everywhere. The contest is on. Now, after a while, the old man started to sweat. He stepped back, wiped his brow, and he sat down. The young man said, I got him now. I got him now. And he kept chopping away. Seemed like he tried to work harder and harder. Old man got back up. He started chopping again himself. And he was chopping good, doing a good job. But he got tired again. And he wiped his brow again, sat down, and began to rest. Got back up. Start chopping again. Start chopping again. And eventually the whistle blew to end the contest. And they said, let's count up the pieces of wood to see who cut the most wood. Lo and behold, the old man had cut more wood than the young man. And the young man said, how in the world did you cut more wood than I did when you were taking breaks, when you were sitting down and wiping your sweat? He said, every time I sat down, I took time to sharpen my axe. I came by to tell somebody today, just sharpen your axe. The reason why I'm here today, I'm here to sharpen my axe. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep his my prayer. It is good for us to be here. 
Amen. Come on, give Dr. Petty a hand. <laughs> Amen. Thank God. I, I, I believe it's, it's safe to say that we all need encouraging. Amen. If everybody, uh, it's not always on the mountain. Uh, some of us are in the valley. But those of us who are on the mountain ought to be able to reach down and pull others out of the valley. Two boys that was walking down the field fell down in a hole. Both of them fell down at the same time. One looked at the other one saying, get us out of here. Amen. We can't get nobody out if we all in the hole. And every now and then we got to be able, somebody ought to be able to lift somebody up. I need you and you need me. Amen. Come on, give them another hand. Thank God, Dr. Dr. Petty. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, be encouraged. It's going to be all right. Trouble don't last always. Weeping endure for a night. But joy going to come early in the morning. Do y'all believe that? I believe that. I believe that. Amen. It's, it's time to give. We want to give today to be a blessing uh, to this, this church. We thank this church. We thank you, Strangers Rest, for opening your doors for us and your pastor on tonight and um, we're, we're asking we're asking if if you have it that you will sow a twenty dollar seed on tonight and uh, i know all these preachers who are, are here we're going to do that and if you have it we ask that you would do it uh, the songwriter said you can't be god given amen and the more you give to him the more he gives to you do y'all believe that? Amen. If you throw God a golf ball, he's going to throw you back a tennis ball. If you throw God a tennis ball, he's going to throw you back a baseball. If you throw God a baseball, he's going to throw you back a basketball. If you throw him a basketball, he's going to throw you back a beach ball. Because you cannot beat God giving. No matter how hard you try. Amen. Father God, we thank you for the seed that we have today. We pray that the seed that's about to be sown will be sown into good ground. And we pray, God, that we receive hundredfold what you have already promised. Thank you, God, for giving to us that we may give a portion back to you. We thank you in the name of Jesus, the Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Our usher is now coming and directing us in our giving. Here you go, Pastor Anthony. Transition, the choir can transition to the choir lock. You try. We pray. Thank you. Come on, strangers rest. Choir, come on. We're excited to hear you on tonight.
Again, we thank God for the, all these preachers that are with us on tonight. And um, the Strangers Rest Choir is going to come and bless us with uh, A or A and B or whatever God has placed on your heart. And um, Pastor L.J. Gillespie is, is going to come and introduce our preacher after the choir would have blessed us. Amen. Thank you. 
God said together, amen, amen, and amen again. To God be the glory for all the great, wonderful, and marvelous things that he hath done. How blessed we are for another day that the Lord has made. Even now we can rejoice and be glad in it. To our beloved, highly revered, highly esteemed pastor host for this time of sharing uh, in fellowship. Certainly we celebrate Dr. Eddie Brown. Come on, help us say thank you to the man, to the brother, to the gift of God that he is, not only to the people of God, but to the preachers of the gospel. Thank you, my brother, to all of my esteemed colleagues, to all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I am grateful for this awesome privilege to share with you uh, a few uh, introductory words as it relates to our preacher for the evening. First of all, how do you capture the essence of this man in just a few words of introduction? Uh, first of all, if it required a lengthy introduction on his behest, then he probably wouldn't deserve it. But because he chooses not to have a lengthy, uh, yes, introduction, it's because he does deserve it. I want to present to you the proud pastor of the Cathedral Church of Christ Church in Faith Church in the city of Beaumont, Texas. My friend, my brother's fasten your seatbelt. He is the Reverend Dr. Delbert Mack. Amen. We say for, certainly offer praise unto our God, thanking him for all of his goodness and his mercy, which each of us has been a recipient of again on this day. His mercies are indeed new uh, every morning uh, to, uh, again, the fine pastor of this church, our friend, our dear brother, one we uh, understand to be a gift to the body of Christ. And uh, we certainly thank God for him. We especially thank God for his hospitality uh, since we have uh, been here and for the loving spirit that he has toward the brothers and for his faithfulness uh, to our God, to all of the other pastors and preachers who are gathered here tonight uh, and this, uh, these two days uh, to share and to encourage one another and seek to sharpen ourselves that we might be more effective tools uh, in the hand of God and for that wonderful privilege. I uh, am grateful and uh, to this church family we want to thank you for your graciousness as well and for your assisting your pastor in hosting uh, us this week and it is our prayer that as a result of our being here that the Lord might uh, bless this church fellowship as well. I want to invite your attention to the 18th chapter of the book of Exodus. Of course, the primary purpose for our gathering is for iron to sharpen iron, for pastors and preachers to think more pointedly about how we might be more effectively for the Lord. And in this setting tonight, I want to also uh, keep in mind uh, the membership of local congregations and how uh, we might be impacted as well. So the 18th chapter of the book of Exodus, I want to read verses 17 through 23, and I'll refer to other sections of this chapter. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them, to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of ten. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure 
and all the people shall also go to their place in peace. I want to use for a subject this evening, celebrating and administrating among God's people. Celebrating and administrating among God's people. Of course, the book of Exodus is the book of being uh, led out, the people of God being led out of bondage in Egypt. It is a story that even somebody who is just a marginal Christian is no doubt familiar with. And yet it is a story that has so much truth that is so pertinent to what we today experience in our church families. For those of you who are not Old Testament people and say, I simply read the New Testament, then I would tell you that this passage is almost mirrored by the sixth chapter of Acts, verses one through six. But here we have the people of God. They have just been led out of Israel, but God has not simply led them out of Israel. He has done it in a miraculous way. God has so impressed all of them that nobody could have gone through this experience and not be impressed with who God is. This is a story for anybody who is not familiar with it. Uh, Moses was leading the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt. There were at least probably 600 men and some have estimated possibly as many as a million to two million people who were marching with him. These were people who had been enslaved for many years and therefore they had no political structure. They had no military structure. They were not familiar with governing themselves and yet they are led out now as a group of people who have now been called the people of God. Now that they have left Egypt, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has changed his mind and decided that he again does not want to let them go. And so therefore he and his army, and they had chariots with the army and horses, they were chasing after these people who were on foot, people who had children with them and were unable to move at a swift pace and certainly could not stop and defend themselves along the way. So they just kept marching and they came to the place called the Red Sea. Now they are at the Red Sea. The Red Sea stands before them and where they understand that God wants to lead them. On both sides of uh, the Red Sea, we are told that there are mountainous regions where they cannot certainly scale the mountains and behind them is Pharaoh and his army. They are what we would call boxed in, nowhere to go, no way to get out. They are now in an impossible situation. It is a time when they start to reflect and say, we should have just stayed slaves. It's a time when they look at the one who is leading them and say, you led us into this mess and so they were angry with Moses. Moses of course had only led them into this situation because God had led him. So Moses went back to his leader and God said uh, Moses said unto God Lord you led me into this situation. The people are angry with me. I'm coming to you because I'm looking for instruction. God said okay Moses stop talking to me and go back to talking to them and this is what I want you to tell them. I want you to tell them to just stand still and watch me work. He said, see the salvation of the Lord, same thing. Just watch me work. Are you you wondering why I led you out. You haven't seen all that I can do yet. And so therefore, Moses, the rod that I have given unto you, which is symbolic of the authority that I have placed in your hand, I want you to take the rod and just stretch it out toward the sea. Moses did that. It was a simple thing to do, nothing scientific about it. There is no reason for any of us to believe that if you take a rod and uh, take it and extend it toward water, that anything of significance will happen. But obedience is what was important here and faith and a willingness to uh, simply trust in the Lord. So Moses did what the Lord had commanded him to do and what the Lord did was the Lord walled up the water of the Red Sea on two sides. The Lord made a pathway. He made a highway for them to go through. Being gracious like God was, he didn't just make a muddy highway, but instead he sent a wind through and dried it out so that they were able to walk through on dry ground. In my imagination, I'm trying to figure out what that must have been like. Can you imagine it with me? Can you imagine just walking through the Red Sea and it's almost like you have an aquarium on both sides of you? Can you imagine a little children saying, Mama, look at that big fish, and another little boy saying, Mama, what is that with all of those tentacles and long legs? But they are walking through the Red Sea. Now there are those who said that there was no miracle that took place then. Some scholars suggest that it was not the Red Sea, but rather the Reed Sea. And they said the Reed Sea was only about 12 inches deep. Well, keep following me with this. They went on through what we understand to be the Red Sea. And when they got to the other side, they were just marveling that they had made it. Well, Pharaoh and his army decided that if you all can go through, we can go through too. But when they went through the Red Sea, God just collapsed the walls of the water and Pharaoh and his army 
army were drowned in the Red Sea. So again, there are those who say no real miracle took place that day because it was just the Red Sea. Well, it has to be a miracle one way or another. Either it was a miracle and God opened up the Red Sea and let about two million people go through, or it was a miracle because God drowned an army in 12 inches of water. So either way you go, whether you go at Red Sea or Reed Sea, it still had to be a miracle. But now when they get to the other side, then they find themselves ready to celebrate and worship God and to think about the mighty acts that he has done. Can't you imagine them looking at one another and being like my friend, uh, Pastor Gillespie, and maybe saying, won't he do it? <laughs> or somebody else saying, ain't God all right? Can you just imagine what that worship experience must have been like? Moses made up some songs about the experience, and he reflected upon it and talked about how God led them through, how God had dealt with their enemies. Miriam, his sister, took up the tambourine, and she and some other ladies started playing the tambourines and they started dancing. Everybody was having a wonderful time. It was a wonderful time of celebration and worship. Who doesn't like to be a part of those kind of experiences? Who doesn't like to be in a situation where we're just reflecting upon the goodness of God? But then after that, they come to a period where they're now having some issues to deal with. They have a number of issues to deal with in this particular uh, text that I have read. Here we have them. They're now settling down. The worship experience has concluded. They're no longer really focusing on celebration, but now they're focusing on administration. It is important for the people of God to always remember it cannot just be celebration. There has to also be some administration. But that administration will affect your celebration. <laughs> if you have enough administration problems, it will affect your celebration. Oh yeah, the service will stop. It will pause. The, the joy and the enthusiasm will wane if there is not some administration. So here is Moses. Moses is seeking to be a good administrator. He's seeking to take care of the affairs of the people of God. He is seeking to be true and accountable unto God and the people for the position that he has been placed in. And so now he is at this point and he is standing before the people. And as he stands before the people, he's simply trying to be a good and effective leader. As he is standing there, his father-in-law, who is not a Jewish a person, but rather a Midian priest. He now has brought Moses' wife and children back because they had been sent away while Moses was carrying out uh, his obligation for deliverance. And so now Jethro has brought his family back unto him. While Jethro is there, Jethro almost acts like a church consultant. He is now in the process of really just evaluating what is going on between Moses and the people of God. So he watches the scene that is there before him, and this is what uh, we find that he saw. He saw Moses standing uh, before all of the people. And that was a long line as the people were standing there because they wanted to talk to Moses. As the people were standing there and talking to Moses, they were, of course, not in a climatized area. There was no air conditioning. If it was hot, there was no heating. If it were cool, whatever the situation was, all of them were out in the elements. And they were standing in a long line. And I don't know if you've ever been in a long line and the area in which you were standing was not climatized. You can imagine how the people were talking and acting when they were in a long line. I'm almost sure somebody had to say, this doesn't make no sense for him to have us out here standing in this long line. But Moses was trying to do the best that he possibly could, and so he stood there. One person would come, and one person would have their issue dealt with. No doubt somebody there probably took longer than people thought. Now, she's been up there long enough. It's time for her. He can't handle everything in one day. But no doubt, the people are standing there in a long line, and so the people, no doubt, are frustrated. Moses, of course, the Bible says he stood there from early in the morning till late in the evening. Can you imagine how tiring and exhausting that much have been? I would imagine he started off fresh in the morning. He had good, crisp uh, answers to the issues and questions that people had. But by late in the evening, again, he just did not have the emotional strength and the uh, physical strength to perhaps deal with issues like he would. But because of his commitment, he kept on showing up morning after morning to talk to the people. And the people kept showing up because they had issues and concerns that needed to be addressed. And so now these individuals who have just recently finished celebrating are now in a situation where their joy has been gone. And so as Jethro Moses' father-in-law is looking at this, what he sees when he looks at Moses and the people is he sees caregiving, but he also sees a caregiver. 
he sees the people, but he also sees a leader. He sees the sheep, but he also sees a shepherd. And as he is looking at this, he begins to analyze what he has seen. And now he goes uh, to Moses and makes some suggestions unto Moses. He goes to Moses and says, Moses, I've been watching you. I've been observing. I'm, 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 I'm an outside party. I'm standing apart. I'm not in what you all are in. I'm not in line. Neither am I at the head of the line uh, trying to solve people's problems. So I have more of an objective view. I can look at it in a way that neither you nor the people may be able to look at it. And let me tell you what I see. What I see, Moses, is I see you being engaged in a situation that is not sustainable. I see you being in a situation, Moses, that neither you or the people are going to ultimately be blessed out of this arrangement. And so I just want to make some suggestions to you. Now, do not lose appreciation for the fact that, again, uh, Jethro is Moses' father-in-law. So no doubt he's thinking in his mind, if you're standing out here with these people every day from morning until evening, when are you going to see my daughter? And no doubt he had to also uh, be saying, if you're standing here from morning till evening, who's going to take care of my grandchildren? It was, it was a logical question for him to have really thought about. So he was not totally objective because he was saying, not only is this not going to be good for you and the people, but it's not going to be good for my family either. And so therefore, Moses, I'd like to have your ear if I could. And so he talks to Moses and he says, so Moses, uh, and I skipped on to verse 17, Moses, the thing that thou doest is not good. Doesn't say, Moses, you are not good, but the thing that you are doing is not good. He says, Moses, once again, it's not going to be something that you can sustain. You are not going to be able to physically sustain it. I don't care how your heart is. I don't care what you want to do. I don't care if people even convince you, Moses, you are the man. You can do it. And I don't care if people are out there saying unto you, well, because you're the leader, you're supposed to be to the, uh, available to the people 24-7. You need to always be available. Whenever something is needed, you need to be able to jump up, run out there, and deal with the situation. He says, Moses, it is not a sustainable sustainable situation. Here's what I want to do then for you, Moses. I want to give you this counsel and this suggestion. And then once I give it to you, you pray about it and see what the Lord says that you ought to do. Moses, this is what I say that you ought to do. You ought to go to God on behalf of the people, and then you ought to go to the people on behalf of God. And then, Moses, you're going to have to do some other things in order that there might be this balance between celebration and administration. Let me say there are three key words I want to lift before us, and then I will conclude. So the first thing uh, he does is he asks Moses, why are you doing what you're doing? So first of all, what Jethro does is he analyzes the situation. And I'm saying every pastor and all the people who make up congregations, one of the things we have to do is analyze what we're doing and ask ourselves why we do what we do the way we do it. Why are we structured and organized the way that we are? What are the expectations that we have of ourselves? What are the expectations we have of our leaders? What are the expectations we have of the membership? How have we reached some conclusions that we have reached? Why are we still doing some things, perhaps, that don't seem to be working in the way that they ought to? Have we given enough analytical thought to the things that we are doing? And so he says, Moses, why are you doing it? Moses says, because I care. He says, the people come to me with their concerns. Now, I'm with Moses on that. You never want to have a leader who doesn't care. You don't want somebody who's having just a position but doesn't carry out a function. You don't want somebody who just likes to have the title but don't want to do the work that goes along with it. You don't want some people that don't care. You don't want a youth worker that doesn't care about youth. You don't want a mission worker that doesn't care about mission. You don't want a preacher that doesn't care about preaching. You don't want a pastor that doesn't care about the welfare of the people of God. Moses said, it's because I care. I'm with Moses. That's a good thing to care. And God bless a church that has a pastor. Who cares? And so here is Moses. Moses says they come to me because uh, they have a concern. And we must understand that all people have concerns. People have cares. There are legitimate needs that are a part of every congregation. We cannot deny those needs. We cannot make, make people feel bad about having needs because when we come together, all of us must understand that we are in this group that has been brought together because God has said, whosoever will, let him come. And when we come, all of us bring the issues that we have. There are individuals who will argue back with me, maybe want to banter back with and fall with me uh, intellectually on that and say, well, I don't have any issues. I say if you run across somebody who says, I don't have any issues in your mind, you can just say, I found one of your issues. <laughs> one of your issues is you don't know you have issues. And one of the most 
one of the most difficult people to deal with is a person who don't believe they have any issues. They believe everybody else in the whole group has issues, but they don't have issues. It's normal for us as individuals to have issues. And so Moses says people have concerns, and people want to be heard. They want their concerns to be heard, and therefore they're willing to stand in a long line so that I can hear what their concerns are with the hope that I'm going to be able to deal with their issues. So then Moses, you're standing up here all by yourself. Why are you doing that? Well, one of the things, and we don't find that out till later, Moses may have had in the back of his mind uh, that I don't know that I can really trust anybody else. I don't, I don't know that if I try to let somebody else help me that they might not really create more problems than they help me. And then later on, of course, Moses goes up to the mountain uh, to get the Ten Commandments from the Lord. And while he is there, the Lord said, hey, Moses, you need to go back down there. Your people are gone crazy. Those people are gone wild. They're doing all kinds of things. And so then Moses, I think, kind of had some issues with that. My people, these really your people that you call me to lead. But since you God, I'll go back down there. And when he went back down there, he found that he found that the person that he had left in charge had deviated, had strayed, had gone completely away from what God had commanded them to do. And the thing that was really striking was that this person was his biological brother. And so he asked Aaron, Aaron, for accountability. How did you let this happen? How did you come up with a golden calf? You know we don't worship golden calves. We worship the true and a living God. And so then uh, Aaron really found himself saying, well, the people came to me. They gave me the earrings. I threw them in the fire and out popped the calf. So then that was no accountability. I would imagine the next time the Lord would say, Moses, I need you to come back up to the mountain. I would imagine Moses say, I don't know if I can leave because if I leave, every time I come back, I might have a mess like that. So Moses was trying to do the very best that he could, and he was trying to deal with the situation. He said, so Moses, first of all, you need to analyze what you're doing, but secondly, let's prioritize what you're doing. He says, Moses, listen, you need to understand you can't do everything. You need, to do, you need to understand you are a limited commodity. There's only one of you. I'm amused sometimes. I've gone to ordinations and installations, and I have sometimes heard a person stand up and say to the newly installed pastor, and they have said unto him, you are to be here for the people. You are to be available unto them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, I'm sitting there in my mind saying, that's Jesus. There's no human being who can be available 27, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Jesus alone, he's the one that's able to do that. The Bible concerns, says concerning God, he neither slumbers nor sleep, but all leaders slumber and sleep. All leaders have to close their eyes, have to be refreshed. Uh, and so he says, uh, he, he says, so you need to be aware of the fact you can't do everything, so you need to identify what's most crucial for you to do. What is this thing that the people need from you more than they need anything else? It doesn't mean that you don't have a lot of things to do, but you have to prioritize. Prioritize. What's the main thing that you need to do? Again, in the sixth chapter of Acts, uh, the apostles were faced with the same situation. There was arguing going on among them because people said, our needs are not being met. And so therefore, the disciples were trying to meet the people's needs and then stop and teach each Bible lesson and then get ready to uh, preach and then get ready to have some time to pray. And so finally they analyzed the situation and they said, you know what? We can't be everywhere at the same time. They said, you know what? We can't do all that is expected of us. So they went back to the people and said, listen, we've had a chance to think about it and to pray about it. And what we have concluded is that we need to change our priorities. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. We need to make sure we do what nobody but us has been authorized by God to do in the way that we as apostles are doing it. And so we have concluded that we need to spend time talking with God and we need to spend time listening while God talks to us. We need to talk to God so we can talk to you on behalf of God. When Jethro was looking at this situation, no doubt he was thinking, now Moses, you're up here talking to these people for God. You're up here because the people are coming to you and saying, what does God say about this matter? And so therefore, Moses, you're spending all this time with the people. My question to you is, so if you're spending all this time with the people, when do you get to spend some time with God. So, so since you are out here now giving answers, when do you have time to get answers? Because you have to let God answer you so you can answer the people of God when they come to you on behalf. So he says, so, so Moses, what you need to do is you need to go to God on behalf of the people. You need to go to God and pray for the people. You need to spend time with God talking about the people of God and asking God to bless them and to provide things that they are needed. And then you need to listen to God as he speaks to you. And once God speaks to you, then you need to take the oracles of God. You need to take his laws and uh, decrees and 
and commandments, and you need to go back to the people and tell them that. Because Moses, you need to understand, and again, the disciples reached the same conclusion, the only way we can be what God wants us to be is to know what God has to say. You can't do the word if you don't know the word. You cannot live above your learning. You cannot do better than you know to do. And so, therefore, he says, you got to study the word. There are others who might again argue and say, well, no, I know what you're saying about studying the word, but I, I believe praise is what we ought to do. I'm not against praise, but how are you going to know how to praise him without the word? Some other people say, I believe stewardship is what's important, but how are you going to know how to be a good steward without the word? That's part of the problem that we have a lot of times. People just coming up with things, and you will hear people in the church just testify the way I see it, and the last thing the church ought to want to know is the way you see it. Because what we want to know is not the way you see it. We want to know what God has said. Why would we settle for your advice when we got a word from the Lord? We want to know what God has to say. Moses, he says, that's what you need to do. You need to prioritize for God. Because what you want to do is you want to keep the focus on God. You want everybody to always remember that the church really belongs to God. And these Hebrew people really belonged unto God. So you need to make sure that you go to him for them. And then you need to make sure that you go to them for him. You need to understand that you are a go-between. In the New Testament, we understand that there are different now that Christ has come, but the primary issue is still the same. If you're in that leadership role, you are to represent God uh, to the people, and then you are to represent the people unto God. So he says, Moses, I've been looking, and that would be my suggestion unto you. Now, he looked at that because, again, he knew that what Moses was doing was unsustainable. People often are amuse me when they talk about pastor's family, and then look at the fact that they don't expect the pastor to ever be with his family. You cannot build a strong relationship with anybody you can't spend time with. I thought about it in my own life. I thought about it in my own ministry, and I've been in ministry for many, many years now, and I've looked at the fact that I said, you know, a lot of times as uh, pastors, we don't spend enough time with our uh, families, and so Moses' position could have been, well, I'm going to be here from morning until evening, so what are you going to do about Mrs. Moses? Then the thing would have been many times we said, well, while I'm up here from evening, uh, from morning until evening, I'll get Mrs. Moses a chair, and she can just wait up here at the church house with me while I do what I need to do. Well, Mrs. Mrs. Moses might do that for a little while, but at some point, Mrs. Moses is going to say, I want to do what the other women's husbands are doing with them, too. Mrs. Moses will finally conclude and say, listen, I don't just want a man of God. I want a husband, too. Everybody is praising you for the way you preach, but I didn't just marry a preacher. I married a man. I married a husband. I want the same kind of things that every other woman wants. And so, therefore, you told me you had to go counsel them. Well, while you were gone counseling them every night, every week, then nobody was here to counsel so me. And so therefore, I need more than what you are sharing with me. I don't want to be too long, but I do want to try to cover this since I came. And then with our children at the same time, when my daughter was young, I have a son and a daughter. When my daughter was young, she would call me sometimes uh, right after school and she would say, uh, Daddy, and I would tell them, anytime my family calls, always put them through. I don't care who I'm uh, speaking with. And so I called my daughter. My daughter would call me and I say, hey, baby, everything all right? She says, yes, Daddy, everything uh, is fine. And I was just, I said, well, baby, I'm in a meeting right now. I said, so let me get back with you later. She just said, okay, but you have to know my daughter. And then so uh, the next day I called her uh, back and I said, hey, baby, Maybe you uh, wanted to talk to me the other day and I was uh, busy. And she said, oh, no, that's all right, Dad. I made an appointment. Because what, her, what she was saying unto me is, every time I call you during the day while you're at the church, you're in an appointment. And what I've come to understand is people who have an appointment are over me. And so, therefore, what I'm going to do is make an appointment with you. And that changed that for sure because I said, you ought not have to make an appointment. But the point, again, was being made. Moses, you have to have some balance in your life. And so then... Need to do that. And then the, the final thing is you need to systematize. Moses, you need to have a way of doing things because the fact that you care is a good thing. Your motive is good. Your method is bad. And so it is not your motive that needs to change. It's your methodology. It's not what you want to do that's bad. It's the way you're trying to do it that's ineffective. And so therefore, Moses, you're going to have to make some changes. And so this is what I would suggest that you do, Moses. I know that you have at least 600,000 people that you are trying to minister to, and perhaps you might have as many as a million or two million. This is what I would suggest that you do. You need to restructure. You need to reorganize. You need to get some groups, and you need to break them into large groups of thousands and then hundreds 
and 50s and then all the way down to 10. He says you need to try to get to the ultimate point of where there's a 1 to 10 ratio of people having their needs met. You need to break it down so small until there are other people who are dealing with different issues. And he says, I'm going to divide the issues up into the small issues, and I'm going to divide the issues up into the major issues. Moses, if you all are having a function, you don't have to be over the forks and the spoons. Moses, you can put somebody else over that. Somebody else can make sure you have uh, forks and spoons. Somebody else can make sure that the quail gets smoked. Somebody else can make sure that the bread gets ba baked. Moses, you don't have to do all of it. You need to know who's doing it, and you need to make sure that it's being done. Moses, I know some of them are saying, well, who's going to watch over our babies? Moses, you don't have to try to be over the nursery or the children's ministry directory. Get somebody to do that. Men's ministry, women's ministry, mission ministry, youth ministry, all of the other things. Organize it, Moses. Structure it where somebody is seeing all of those things. Let issues come up to you. If it's something that you need to get involved in, then get involved with it. But if you don't need to get involved with it, just structure it and explain to people and teach them the word of God so that they will know how to handle it. He said, so if you do that, Moses, he said, you will be able to survive. But then also he concludes with saying, and the people will go home in peace. Ain't nothing like a church where the people got peace. Ain't nothing like a church where the mess has all been dealt with. Ain't nothing like being a part of a situation where you got administration, but your focus is on celebration. We have a way of doing things. We're structured and we are organized, but we're not meeting every day fussing over mess. We're meeting every day talking about how good God is. We want to get back to won't he do it. We want to get back to ain't God all right. We want to get back to bless his holy name. We want to have testimonies about how he made a way out of no way. We realize that we have to have administration, but we realize that at the same time, we want to focus on celebration. So then the final thing that the people of God would have to be very careful about, and Moses no doubt would face that, can people accept ministry from anybody but the pastor? You know, there could be times in a situation where a pastor might go to the hospital, and then people will tell the person when they're leaving, whether it be a deacon or another person in membership, it's good to see you, but tell pastor I'm looking for him too. But if I'm going to be there, you don't need to be there. If I'm going to go, you might as well just let me go. I can't be there and everywhere. I heard Dr. E.K. Bailey say many years ago, I might not be there when you go into the operating room, but if you give me time to study, I'll have you ready when you go in. I might not always be there for every life event that you have, and even though I want to be there for many, but if I just get to do the things that I need to do with God, God will prepare me to prepare you to deal with things that you are going to need to deal with. And so he says, so we got to get more people involved because what Moses had was a situation where everybody who was before him was just looking for what they could get. But he says, Moses, you can't have people just looking for what they can get. You have to also have them looking at what they can give. You have to also help people understand you can't just be a recipient. You have to also be somebody who blesses people as well. Somebody came to me one time and they say, Pastor, when I had death in my family. They said, didn't enough people show up? Now, I was there and others were there, but they said a lot of people didn't show up. I tried to say it as kindly as I possibly could, but I was just asking them, have you ever been there for anybody else? You were saying who didn't show up when you were down. I'm just wondering, did you show up for anybody else? It has to be a situation where people understand we need help. He says, Moses, the work is too heavy. You can't do it by yourself. You got to have help. And thank God for people in the congregation who will help. Thank God for people in the congregation who says, Pastor, you can't do it all. I'm here to help you. Thank you, Pastor. I know I need what I need because I have needs like everybody else. But I'm not just concerned about what I can receive. I'm also concerned about how I can help somebody else, too. I'm glad they showed up when my mama died, but now I want to show up when somebody else's mama died. I'm glad that I was able to be a recipient of the many ministries that the church has, but now I want to use that to help somebody else. Because, Pastor, I understand you are one man, and you can only do so much. I know you get flattered when people try to make you think you're Jesus. I know you get flattered when people think you're indispensable, but the truth of the matter is when we die, the church going to roll right on. And so therefore, we have to keep in mind, I can only do what I can do. Moses, make sure you understand that your motive is good, but your methodology is bad. Do what God has called you to do as your highest priority, and then let God lead you to lead his people to make you a concerned community. Not just you, but a concerned community. Not you by yourself, but everybody working together. And when you do that, we can put our attention on Jesus. Because when they went through the Red Sea, they had to be saying, wow, look at how God split the Red Sea. Well, I haven't been through a Red Sea, but let me tell you what has me saying, wow. 
when I look at one Friday evening, <laughs> Jesus Christ went up on a hill called Calvary, died for my sin. But I don't have a dead Savior because early Sunday morning, God raised him up from the dead with all power in his hand. And ever since I heard about it, I've been saying, wow. I've been saying, ain't he all right? I've been saying, doesn't God love me? I've been saying, hadn't God made a way for me? Hadn't God given me salvation? That's what I want to really focus on. I want to focus on God and his goodness in my life. But I realize that if you're going to have celebration, you got to have administration. Because celebration without administration will soon lead to frustration and keep us from being what God wants us to be. Just in case there is someone here who has not had that opportunity to say wow over the event that happened and we celebrate this week and this coming Sunday. Just in case there's someone who has not yet accepted or confessed publicly Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Here is an opportunity. Now is the day of salvation. The day you hear my voice, saith the Lord, harden not your heart as your fathers did in the provocation. Don't let this opportunity pass. It is, it, is, it, is, it is urgent and necessary that you secure your eternity and your, and, your, and your position with God as one of his children. The door of the church is open for the reception of members by letter or by Christian experience or as a candidate for baptism. If there's one or more, would you come? And the extent invitation is to whosoever. Whosoever. And Baptists have a song for everything. And one of the songs we sing is whosoever will, let him come. And I, I'd like to sing a little bit of that now. <laughs> whosoever will, let him come, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come and be saved whoso ever will let him come let him come and drink of the life given strength oh if a gambler wants to come Oh, let him come, let him come. If a gambler wants to come, let him come and be saved. If a gambler wants to come, oh, let him come, let him come. Let him come, whoso 
Accept or reject the divine invitation. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Can't be any proper celebrating without the right administrator. Analyze, prioritize, and systematize. Come on, give Pastor Mac a hand. Thank God. Devil Mac. Pastor Devil Mac, I'm glad you came. Dr. F.D. Sampson, I'm glad you came. <laughs> Amen, amen. What a blessing these men of God are to us and to the body of Christ. And thank you too as well, Pastor Petty, for your encouraging words as well. What a great night this has been. And um, I I'm going to step out the way because I want the pastor of this, this church to come and give further direction we do celebrate Pastor Brown as it comes. My friend and brother. Thank you. Amen. Amen. To our leader for tonight. Amen. Our master of, of ceremony. Amen. Pastor Bale, uh, who is no stranger to uh, the Strangers Rest Church and certainly to. Uh, my pastor, uh, clergy brothers, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, Strangers Rest. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this celebration. Amen. And uh, we are having a great time. Let me thank uh, Sister uh, Dion for stopping by early this morning and getting us some apple, apple, yeah, it was good. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor Nelson had plenty of it. Amen. Uh, but I want to thank you for that. Uh, certainly, uh, Deacon Strouder, who uh, opens the door, closed the doors, and uh, he will not leave until everybody's gone. And so we'll appreciate him. 
uh, let me uh, personally thank these pastors for allowing us to host and share. Amen. Thank you uh, for this great uh, experience. Amen. And we always have a great experience when we come together, and so uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, we will meet tomorrow morning uh, at 10 o'clock. Amen. And uh, we will uh, further our uh, sharpening uh, on tomorrow morning. Amen. Amen. As we uh, uh, obtain some pastoral balance. Amen. Pastoral balance. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mac, for helping me tonight that we need balance. Amen. Because we're more than just pastors. Amen. Your husband, your Amen. Your father, your if you get to my age, you're a pawpaw. So Amen. You gotta do a whole lot of stuff. Amen. But this gets us balanced. And that's what I received tonight. It's pastoral balance is what we need. Amen. Amen. That's all I have. I think that's it. Amen. We are ready for uh, our benediction. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Tomorrow at, at um, noonish, 11.30 noonish, we want you to come. If you can be here tomorrow Amen. and come hear Dr. F.D. Sampson. If you're retired, come on out. If you get a lunch hour between 11.30, 12.30, come on out. You don't want to miss Dr. F.D. Sampson. Come on out. And I guarantee you, we'll do you well. Amen? Amen. Come on, Pastor Mac, would you come now for the benediction? Let me take this time to apologize to Pastor uh, Petty. I'm a little weary and a little tired physically, I think, as most of us are after preaching and traveling. Uh, I didn't mention, but I was so blessed uh, by your word tonight. But I got up, my mind kind of went immediately to trying to um, do what I was asked to do. But I was thoroughly blessed uh, by, by your word tonight. Uh, why don't we all stand and we'll have our concluding prayer. Lord God, our Father, we want to say thank you for your graciousness to us even on this entire day. And then we thank you for your graciousness for us this evening and allowing the people of God to gather in the place that has been set apart to worship and to work for you. We thank you for the Strangers Rest Church Fellowship. Thank you, Lord, for the hospitality that they've extended unto us. Thank you for those who have done the things that were needed and necessary this evening, those things that have relieved the pastor of having to try to do it all, but rather uh, for them to do it as a community of believers. Again, we do thank you for Pastor Brown. We thank you for his leadership. We thank you for uh, his love. And again, we thank you for the tremendous gift. Thank you for Pastor Petty and his sharing with us on tonight, encouraging fellow brethren and others who are part of the body of Christ. We pray, Lord, that we will think deeply and long about what he has shared with us as the word that has come from you. And then, Lord, we pray for tomorrow's meeting. We pray, first of all, for extended grace. We pray that you'll awaken us in the morning, that we'll find all things well, that we'll be able to make our way back to this place. And therefore, Lord, we pray for those who will be sharing on tomorrow. We pray for the time of uh, preaching as well. And we pray that by the time we conclude whatever you purpose to do, we pray that it will have been done in our lives. And as a result of that, all of us might be refreshed and ready to go back to the work of ministry and do those things that are pleasing unto you. And now tonight, uh, we ask that you provide the grace that we need for our travel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. We're dismissed. <laughs>